All right, questions for rewards. Blessed Sunday. Sunday. Sunday's the best day. Okay, so rewards. Revelation 12. There's the woman on the moon. Who, especially in Alexandrian theology, does the moon symbolize? Who? We know the woman can be St. Mary, even the church, etc., but the moon. Who is the moon? <laughs> no one's getting crunched. <laughs> I thought I'd start with one that I thought wasn't a challenge, but I'm not. Yes! Wow. Wow. I don't say why, I don't say why. Well, what was the answer for me? John said, yes. There we go. <laughs> okay, next one is a reward for. Don't give away your answers. Give me one reason why. Why is the moon like St. John the Baptist? It reflects the light of Christ. Reflects the light, so yeah. What's the quote? He said, reflects the light. St. John said, I am not the true light, but he is the light. He was a witness to the light. Very good. Thank you. Give me one more reason why the moon represents uh, or reflects St. John the Baptist. Because the moon yeah, yeah. Because the moon gets the moon is dark in itself, but it gets its light from the sun. So um, Saint John doesn't get his light from his own. He gets his light from the moon. That's good. Unfortunately, that's the part of the same answer. So now, so now I'm not thinking of light. I'm thinking of something else. What does the moon do? It rotates around. Let's see. Let's see hands. Who's got? Who's got hands? I'll give you a clue. Water, go, first hand. Water, oh, tides. Tides, what is that connected oh. with? Oh. <laughs> but I'm still going to give it because it's the right answer. What does the tide do to the water? Rise. Rise is the rising of the water. And lower. Oh. There's baptism. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Now I have to sustain the quality. I don't think we're going to be able to. Who, I mean, even though there may be one person, one writer who says it wasn't so, who is possibly, by tradition, the child that sat on Jesus's lap when he said, "Let the children come to me." Saint Ignatius of. Very good. Wow. I can't read this. God bless you. Good job. Saint, this is this is one that has come up a bunch of times. Um, Saint Gregory the Great, the Dialogist, was writing to uh, the Chalcedonian Patriarch of Alexandria, reminding him because this was after Chalcedon, this is sixth century, reminding him that the See of Peter exists in three seats, three places. Name the three. Rome. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah. Three. That the, yeah, the, the, the authority of Peter is in three places. Yeah, Rome, Jerusalem. Yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah. Rome, Alexandria, Antioch. Very good. God bless you. Good job. Uh, the first time that the word Catholic appears in the writings of the church, the oldest time that we can write, and reminder, we are Catholic, we are Orthodox Catholic, we don't, we're not Roman Catholic, but we're Orthodox Catholic, so what is, where is the first place that the word Catholic appears? The Creed. The Creed, yeah. Before that. The word Kataholos, the, the church is Kataholos. Where is that writing? I'll give you a clue. Oh. The name was already said. Oh. Raise a hand. You gotta raise a hand if you know. Yeah. 
I'll give you another clue. A church father, one of the apostolic fathers. Yes. You gotta have a hand. Where's your hand? The same nation as Nanyang. Very good. <laughs> the name of the first deaconess. Oh, oh my goodness. I didn't know that yesterday. Phoebe. So, who are you going to give this one to? Is there a Phoebe in the room? Is there Phoebe? You get to the side. It's yours, but you can give it away if you want. Saint Peba or Phoebe. <laughs> Name the two uncles of Saint Marcos the Evangelist. What? The two uncles of Saint Mark the Evangelist. <laughs> I'm so I can finally stump Coptic people. I am so proud of myself. <laughs> I'm so glad. The two uncles of Saint Mark. Is it? It's a the one, so You're on the right track. She said James and John. That's the closest guess. I, I will take it. That's the second one. I might have to give it to you. Who are the uncles of St. Mark? I'll give you a clue. James and John are apostles. That your clue. Who are the uncles of St. Mark? Paul and James and John are apostles. That's your clue. Paul and Peter. But Peter and Paul were not brothers. Oh, yeah. Peter and Simon. No, Simon is first. What? Peter. Peter. Saint Peter and Saint Andrew were uncles of Saint Mark. Oh, I know. Um, here's a cool thing, Mike. Um, you know the uh, there's a there's a uh, monastery in Jerusalem called Saint Mark's. Up, and it has the upper room where we believe Christ had his, his mystical supper. And my one of the priests I know, who was my priest in Portland, his sister is a nun and in the upper room, St. Mark's upper room in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, shout out some questions while I pull up my stuff. There you go. Questions. Random questions. Or should I just should I start should I just start in the topic or just questions first? Uh, Questions in general? No, no, no. Within, within the like witnessing, maybe other things, random things, or if you want to know something about the Indian Orthodox or Syriac Orthodox. I have a question about witnessing um, to the outside world, especially. That's the next topic. Good. Okay. Keep no, no, keep on. Let me hear it. Let me hear it. Because well, I, I just want to know because, like, when you have good news, you really want to share it, right? But at the same time, you don't want to come off as pushy or obnoxious. And um, obviously, we witness by our actions, but also sometimes people genuinely like kind of have someone explain it to them. And how I guess how do you balance that? How do you have the wisdom to know? When that's great, it? and that's and we're going to do some exercises that demonstrate that okay, in the talk in number three. So yeah, good. Thank you. On prayer, when you were talking yesterday, you were saying prayer outside the psalms um how does that look like for different people with different personalities like there are people that are talkers naturally so they can stand in front of them and talk there are people that are not that don't have much to say uh, so how does how does that play in, in different personalities uh god makes room for individuality but he also requires unity so what the, in what does he require unity in what does he uh, uh, it welcome uh, individuality because he had 12 very different apostles, right? Or 12 different disciples. One of them was wicked and then put another in his place and they were still different, but they were still one, right? They were one in all the things they needed to be one in, but they still express things differently, right? And that's why the ministry of St. Peter looked different from the ministry of St. John and St. Mark and St. Luke and St. Andrew, because there's room, like when, when Christ says, uh, my father's house are many mansions, right? He has a specific place just for you, right? And so that is important because the dialogue, the way that you talk to people influences the way that you talk to God, right? And the way you talk to God influences the way you talk to people. So does he require everyone to be like a magnificent chanter? No. Does he require everyone to be totally silent? No, otherwise we would never know anything, right? But he appreciates both, right? 
so there's room for that. Um, what's the, I don't remember which priest it was. Is it an ancient story? And he came, and I think this happened in Egypt. He, he uh, was teaching this village how to pray, he's saying, say these prayers, and he says, I'll come back, you know, and, and teach you more later. Uh, try to memorize these. Okay, Father. And he comes back later, and he sees these three men across the, uh, you know, this, he sees these three men across the water, and they start, Father, and they start walking across the water to him, and he's like, right? Like, you don't see that every day. And, uh, and they go, Father, we're so sorry. We tried to remember the prayers you taught us. We can't remember. We've been saying, God, you are three. We are three. Have mercy on us. He goes, whatever you're doing, keep doing it, right? Because it's such a proof that, like, you are holy, right? Who, who else walks on water? St. Peter tried and failed. And we know St. Peter was still great and restored. And then St. Mary of Egypt, right? Like, you don't see that every day. So when we see someone walking on water and it's not a trick, it's a sign that God is accepting their life, right? Their holiness. Uh, so, um, so... I also think not just between people, but between phases in your life. There are times where, think of a husband and a wife, where you're in pain about something, you're embarrassed about something, you can't even speak, right? You can't even speak, um, but you just are in each other's presence, and that's that's what you need for that moment, right? No words, but that's what you need, right? Also, also I I never like to skip on this. If you ever have a time where it's difficult to talk about something with your spouse or anybody, sit down next to them and just say, can I hold your hand? And hold their hand because it's so hard to blame each other when you're holding hands. It's so hard to yell at each other when you're holding hands, right? So it's a great, it's a great pastoral um, uh, tool. Uh, so on that. So there are many ways to communicate. I think God intended it for that to be the case. There are times where, uh, I mean, I love singing to God. But like even today, I'm still getting over some throat thing, and there's just things I couldn't do with my voice. It's like, but I'm I'm reaching out to God with my heart, but I probably sound like uh, 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 right. I think God accepts it, you know, better than someone who's like a fantastic singer, but their heart is far away, right? So, um, so for some people where they're like, oh my gosh, I'm just I don't know how to pray this. Like even someone asked me, right? Okay, the Psalms. I'm just feel like I'm going through the Psalms, and I ask. Are you looking for Christ in the Psalms? Are you finding him? No. So that's another step that you can do to reinvigorate your connection to those Psalms, finding Christ in it. Um, for some people, I've noticed a few people, they're so self-deprecating. They just like think that they're worth nothing. And I said, okay, since you already have a tendency to get depressed about stuff, don't spend all your time in Lord have mercy, right? Say, Lord, have mercy. I love you, God. Thank you, God. Spend time in thankful prayers, right? And still say, Lord, have mercy, but maybe don't do, you know, 40 prostrations every hour if you are already just like, oh, I'm so worthless. It's like you should probably spend time in praying for others, right? So I think that each kind of prayer can be a medicine, including silent prayer. Um, I, try, I try to grow in each kind of prayer that I know of. And uh, sometimes I'm like, gosh, I haven't sat in stillness because that is a form of prayer. I haven't done that for a while. So I'll just sit down and do nothing. I won't say anything. I'll just say, cause myself say, Lord, I'm here. And that's it. Right? And I just stay there as long as I can. And I find that to be refreshing. So, um, so variety, right? If you have the same pasta every day, same rice every day, ugh, God made some variety for our stomachs. I think he made variety for our souls too, right? And that's, that's also a thing why I love hanging out with the other oriental parts of the church because I'm just like, oh my gosh, I love some of the prayers of the priests, even the silent prayers. I'm like, this is just gems, gold, right? And I still love the ones I do, but I love the other embassies, right? Or how even just physical prayers, how you spread the veil and how you cross, how you bless things and all. It's just like, oh, it's just so beautiful, right? So I get fed by seeing the Coptic liturgy, for instance. So, I think variety is okay. Variety is okay. Other questions? But yeah, but maybe uh, you can tell us a little bit about the Indian, the Indian Orthodox Church, uh, what the Pope is, maybe how you got introduced to our church and yeah, the meeting of the Father Luke. Yeah, well, I thought we met in prison. Um, so, he was in prison, I was visiting. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, prison ministry is very good, by the way. Um, but uh, so the, the Indian Orthodox Church, you know, St. Thomas went in 52-ish AD. Um, he converted four, um, well, he was looking for the Jews, right? Because that's why he was sent, because there was a, they knew that there was the so-called lost tribes of Israel. They weren't lost. They knew where they were. They had a lot of connections, and some of them still went to Jerusalem. So there was the knowledge there. 
and he was sent to India, even though St. Thomas, I love him, he was just like so, I don't know, he reminds me of, he's, he was so stubborn, right, and some things, and he's like, didn't want to go. <laughs> he's like, fine, you know, I go to those people, they're crazy, they'll kill me, and he's like, go, and so he's like, okay, and so he was looking for the Jews, and um, he, he was going through these waters in this kind of, uh, you know, a ship that's probably like, probably like from this table to here. It's like a smaller ship. One man kind of can, can run it. Um, and he's going through these backwaters and he sees these uh, four, they were Jain priests actually. They're like, Hinduism's not a religion. It's just a collection of beliefs from the Indus Valley in India. Hinduism's a name given later by English speakers. Um, so Jainism was like one of those branches of uh, beliefs. And they were standing in these backwaters and one of the priests of their religion was in a tank and they'd have some of this ocean water in the tank and they would say their prayers and they would scoop up the water and then throw it up like this until they released all the water from the tank. And, um, and St. Thomas says, what are you doing? And, and they go, and they go, we're saying prayers, you know, to our God and asking him to bless, uh, answer our prayers. And then we're offering him this water. And St. Thomas says, it looks like your God's not receiving your offering. And they're like, Right? They must have been like, you idiot. It's a spiritual thing. And he says, well, if I can show you that my God will receive my offering, will we follow him? He said, yes. So they led St. Thomas into the tank. And he prayed and he scooped up the water. And there was a, a scoop literally left in the water. Like if you scoop jello out, like there's a, there's a, a missing piece of jello. There's like missing water in there. And he prayed and he threw the water up and it stood like stars in the air like this. And then floated up. And those first four converted. One of them named Pablo Matam, I'm supposedly related to, but I don't deserve. Um, but uh, he was one of the first four priests in India. And then St. Thomas established seven and a half churches, as they say, one he was cut short. Um, he he had talked to an Indian Raj or king uh, and said, he says, if you give me money, I will, I will connect your name to an everlasting kingdom, sort of a thing. And so the, the king's like, awesome, I'm gonna be famous. So he gives him all this money to Build, because if by tradition St. Thomas was actually a carpenter, that's the tradition we have in India, and may have been the way that he met Christ, maybe they're carpenters together. Um, and instead of creating a building with his carpentry skills, he gave the money to the poor. And so the king had him speared in the back. And so, um, so anyway, so St. Thomas was an amazing witness. He calmed beasts and did all these things in India um, and uh, witnessed to the end. And so the church there, for over centuries, was kept or had bishops sent from the East Syrian Church, which was which sometimes is called the Church of the East, and sometimes called the Nestorian Church of the East. Later, after Nestorius joined them, um, and they spoke East Sy East Aramaic or East Syriac. West Syriac is also West Aramaic. It's the same language, just a slightly different version. And so for centuries, the uh, the seat of Seleucia Sidisphon would send bishops to India and there would be archdeacons who um, I think they were all descendants from Pagala Matam too. So there would be the archdeacons who would kind of help him minister to the people whose language he didn't speak. So those bishops were sent for years but then the, the, Syri the East Syrians um, at some point they adopted Nestorianism. We don't know how much of it came into India. Probably at least some uh, but the son of Genghis Khan, who's called Tamerling or Timurling, he was, I think he had a Christian mother, Muslim father, and he's like, hmm, I think it would be more fun to be Muslim because then I could do wars and all those other things. So he chose Islam and then slaughtered something like 20 million uh, East Syrians um, at that time. And so they, those who could escape, escaped to back to Baghdad, kind of Iraq area, Mosul, Ninewa province, and some went to India. And there were Christians in India all over speaking different languages and through persecutions later by Hindus also, um, it became so intense they all moved down to what we now call Kero, the southern, southwestern province of India, which is the place where orthodoxy remained basically. Um, and the language they speak called Malayalam is only a language because of all of those different orthodox Christians in India, all their different languages mixing together. Um, and then we were isolated, and there were some really weird practices, I think, for a while. The Portuguese came in because we invited them to protect us against the Ottomans, who had made a threat to destroy the rest of the Christians in India. Uh, and 
we, when we let them in, they were like, oh my gosh, there's Christians here. And actually, the, the Indian Orthodox in Rome shared full communion at that time right away, but then they found stuff that they thought was a proof that we were distorting, perhaps. Could be accurate, I don't know, because they burned those books later. Um, and then they put the Inquisition on our church. So that means that they locked up our priests and, and whatnot, and then we had no liturgies of our own. We were ceasing to exist, and they were Romanizing everything, um, which was sad. Uh, but um, but then we reached out to the Patriarch of Antioch, and he sent bishops um, who risked their own lives, and some of them did die in India, just to make sure we had more bishops and priests to keep us alive. So the Syriac Church of Antioch saved us, basically. But only some of us made it back with Antioch. The rest remain with Rome, and so they're Eastern Catholic churches to this day. Um, and uh, there's interesting relationships, some very positive, some things not as positive. Uh, so by miracle, we're still here. Um, even though St. Gregorius of Parmela, who died about 1902, was an incredible missionary, um, there wasn't a lot of incredible missions after him. And so, uh, so we've just remained as we are, kind of in this sea of Hinduism, surrounded by Western churches and a lot of challenges, and so our people are still figuring out how to do what uh, what they should do. Um, but we're we're very blessed um, in many ways, uh, especially just the richness of the Syriac traditions. We keep we kept getting reinfused with Middle Eastern traditions, and so some things that are ancient Syriac traditions are kind of only done in India. It's kind of like some things from the Coptic traditions are only done in Ethiopia, right? Like the anaphoras that are, you know, there's more anaphoras, Coptic anaphoras used in Ethiopia, for instance. So sometimes when it's displaced, it preserves it, right? Uh, so in a nutshell, that's who we are. We're a very Syriac-influenced church, but very Indian in, in certain flavor and ethos, too. So, yeah, there's a, in a nutshell. So, and one of the six Oriental um, we call it sister churches, but really it's like localities, right? A sister church would be like the Eastern Orthodox because the Oriental Church really is one. We have the same the same thing, uh, but sometimes we call it churches plural, but it's one. All right, should we jump into the? Let's jump in. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Open our eyes, O Lord, so that we may see the wondrous things of Your law. Today we are going from what you already journeyed through a little bit in witnessing to oneself, and we realized you're never actually alone, right? You've always got the angels and the saints who are our family in heaven, and we take that wherever we go, right? We take that wherever we go, and so witnessing to family and friends, you're always still witnessing to yourself, quote, as yourself at the same time, right? And then this third part is witnessing at church, work, school, etc. So how do we do this? Um, so there is so much variety and yet there's some commonalities, right? Um, I feel like a minority wherever I go, right? Even amongst the Indian Orthodox, I'm only half Indian, right? My dad's mostly Irish, my mom's Indian. And uh, even amongst Orthodox, Indian Orthodox are pretty much a small group. Um, so I feel, so even though I feel like a minority, and even though I look exactly like Father Mark, <laughs> the, uh, the Coptic priest from Australia, I guess, um, uh, and people will think I'm Coptic or just think I'm Suriani, uh, so I'm a minority wherever I go. I speak Spanish, I used to teach salsa dancing, uh, play flamenco guitar and rock and roll, and I'm just not exactly surrounded by people exactly like me. So I always feel like a minority, but I never felt like that was a bad thing. And I always felt like it's okay to be who I am, right? And that's the first step of what do we have? We have Christ, we have the fullness of the faith, right? Other people might have great things and we celebrate the good and true and we invite them to the fullness, but we Orthodox Christians are the richest people on the earth. I'm not talking about cash, right? We're the richest people on the earth with the most access to the mysteries of God. And so when you know who you are, then you have something to offer, right? Um, even little kids, they, they, they think of it so simply, like you give them candy, like even uh, I was offered s'mores like at least three times by children last night, it's so sweet. They just know that they're a kid and there are people offered, so they're like, here, I wanna, I was like, wow, right? And the faith can be that simple, right? Just something so pure and simple as that. So we're not talking rocket science. We're talking about make sure you know who you are, make sure you know who God is, or at least say, you know what, come with me, right? I'll take you to the priest, right? And this is an experience of Christ. We're not saying the priest is Christ, but the priesthood of Christ is in the priest. 
right? And so the way that we bring people to God is not just, just like belief. It's bring them to an experience of God, right? And that sounds complicated, but it's actually simple. So like some of your question earlier, right? Um, just being holy, just being kind and gentle and peaceful and patience reminds them of not just who you are, but of your God, right? And so if you are doing everything you can to be blameless and kind and holy, you're teaching them about your God. And as soon as they ask, then you can, you can tell them. Or if their opportunity comes up, you just never know when that best moment is unless you're listening, right? Uh, so whether it's at church or work, at school, etc., let's start with the easiest one, okay? So you're here with your church family, right? So play a game with me, ready? Awkward moments. Don't worry, I've probably done some of the things you're thinking about, of like things that are awkward moments in church. And just have a sense of humor about yourself and be like, oh yeah, it's really awkward when someone does this and be like, and I've done it, right? I'm, I'm probably, um, I, I'm sure I've scared people away from church, for instance, but whether it's someone who's already Orthodox or someone who's visiting, finding out who you are, awkward moments, ready? Go ahead, just raise your hand and say, it's really funny in church when this happens. I'll start. It's really funny when English speakers come and they don't hear any English, right? Which is why you use this, right? Awkward moment, and you're like, oh, it'll be done in three hours, right? So don't, try, try not to think that it's not in English, and they're just like, right? Uh, awkward moments, right? That makes things awkward, hard to bring the faith to them, right? Have you ever seen someone walk through the door that you didn't know? What is a nice, awkward thing that usually happens? Yeah. Just stare. <laughs> like, why are they here, you know? And especially, you gotta remember this, okay, optics, all Middle Easterners, Indians, we got these eyebrows. Even when we're smiling, look at this. People think I wanna kill them, right? Like, it doesn't matter what my mouth is doing, people think I wanna kill them, children think I wanna eat them. And so, when you're around a bunch of Caucasian Americans who are like, what are we doing here now? <laughs> right? Your eyes will terrify them. Okay? So you can't just stare awkwardly, right? <laughs> so you gotta be thinking. Okay, that might be an awkward thing, but it's better than <laughs> okay. right? So, okay, other awkward moments. Go ahead. Just talk about it, because we have to acknowledge it. Yeah. Awkward moment, it doesn't happen to someone. Um, Never. No, it hasn't. I'm not, I've seen it. But, but in one of dances? Sometimes. 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 Um, when people, women, come in and they're not, let's say, Catholic Orthodox, and there's always some thumbs chasing them with a scarf. Almost like a kidnapping. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And holiness is a process, right? Yeah, you know. yeah no, that is an awkward moment. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I mean, it's definitely something that, um, you know, to talk to the bishop about too and say, okay, should we just go ahead and give them a little room here and just say, now when you want to come in, you know, or is it one of those things that's absolute must? You know, we live in a, in a society where everything that we consider to be raising up the holiness of women, people think we're oppressing them, yeah. right? It's like, no, wait, oh, you can't cover women. You're like, it's not Islam, right? It's different. And God bless the Muslims. We have to love them. Uh, but it's not Islam. So you say, well, you can't cover them because what? You're hiding them. And you're like, what did God do with the Ten Commandments? They're so holy, you cover them, right? And the mysteries, why do the priests wear veils on their hands, right? Um, and why do we cover the Eucharist? It's not because it's to be hidden and ignored and it's less. There's nothing more valuable on this universe than what's inside this cup with the veil over it, right? And women are a symbolism of the church. They're literally a walking symbol of the church that Christ died to save them. So for us, when we put a veil on a woman, we're saying something awesome. We're saying women are irreplaceable, which is a really hard thing to say in our society, right? Say, no, no, a man can just have a you-know-what, uh, and all of a sudden he can say he's a woman, we're like, then how special could women be, right? If a woman can be replaced by a man, womanhood's not very special, 
And if a man can be replaced by a woman so easily, then men are not very special. We believe God made them both amazing and unique and compatible and complementary, but not replaceable, right? So when we say head, co head coverings, we're saying women are like a walking church. Women are a great mystery. Women are something so incredibly beautiful that God came through woman to the whole universe. And so that teaching alone, like I never have people saying, not true, <laughs> right? Even Protestants who might have no necessarily reverence for St. Mary, they might think that our head scars are stupid. When I say this, they're usually like, whoa, right? Especially Protestants who appreciate our morality and have the same morality that they share with us. They so appreciate that, that our head coverings say women are irreplaceable, right? That we're raising up womanhood. But we have to do it in all the ways we act, right? That's the other side of it. We can't just say, yeah, you're really special, put a veil on you and the rest of you, you know? They have to say, you do everything you say, right? That's it. That's the other side. So we have to make sure we're behold. But that is an awkward moment, right? So, um, so I don't know what your policy is uh, there, but um, you know, but just talk to a woman about like, you know, do we, do we, are we required to do that for visitors? I mean, and even at St. Gregor's, we ask people to take their shoes off, but some people like, and this is part of the talk too, it's like homeless people, right? They don't, they, they've been wearing the same shoes and socks for a long time. If I have socks to give them, they really appreciate that because some of them, they're so insecure about taking out their shoes and making the whole place go, oh my gosh, I can't even stand next to you because the smell is so bad. They're so insecure. What do I do? I should cover them, right? I should cover their dignity. And so either I say, well, hey, just stand here. It's okay. Don't take out your shoes for today. I'd rather have you here than out because you won't take out your shoes, right? So not all traditions are tied for first place. Do I want him to eventually take off his shoes? Yes. But if I want to make sure someone gives him clean socks, right? Okay, go to the bathroom if you need, wash your feet, put on the fresh socks and come in. Solutions, right? Solutions. Uh, so it's something though, but I mean, I don't know, Abuna, if you want to talk about what your policy is. No, or, I'm, I'm used to doesn't have like a policy for a prisoner or something. something. Yeah. So, uh, so something like that, like you're saying, like you grow into holiness, maybe someone that's new to the church, eventually we would want them to do that. But if someone's visiting or they're new, we're not going to like work yeah. and, and you got to give them a point. You can't just say, here, wear this heavy burden, right? <laughs> Instead, you'd be like, we want you to become one with us. This is part of your oneness with other women and part of the symbol of how important you are to Christ, right? And how the one church, the one bride, right? And that God covers holy things, the whole idea of tabernacling with us, tenting with us, right? Um, so give them a point, even if it's a moment in the dark, it's be like, hey, we just, womanhood is holy. The hair of a woman is considered holy. And we ask you, if you want to wear this, this would be awesome. And just join us. Don't worry about it, right? And if they want to, great. If they reject it, they're going to reject it for some other reason anyway, right? So give them a time. Give them time to get into that, yeah. Other awkward moments? It was like someone's first time and the deacons are speaking like 200 miles an hour. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, they're just like, <laughs> right? Even English speakers don't talk that fast. So I think it is important um, to be careful how fast you pray. I think all speeds are holy, but not all speeds are functional, right? Um, so sometimes, like I said, I will advise people pray fast. Like when you have high anxiety, pray fast and see if you can lower the anxiety with st starting to slow the, the pace. Um, but if people can't participate, and that's really important is participation. Like even a head covering is a participation, right? Um, when someone comes in, uh, you can hear, I mean, these are things that we have done that make, make people immediately start to participate. And we've seen conversions because of this. Even when, I, when we're doing a wedding or a, a funeral or whatever it is where we know there's a lot of guests who are not Orthodox, I take a moment before the services begin and I teach them how to make the sign of the cross. I teach them when we bow, go ahead and bow. When the priest turns and says, peace to you or a blessing, you cross yourself and here's what it means. And here's why it's awesome. And here's why it's a physical prayer because you're worshiping God with your body. And all of a sudden I see all these people who are not Orthodox like, that's awesome, right? They're participating and they don't know how much they're literally blessing themselves. God's blessing them because they're making the sign of the cross on their body. Um, so when someone comes in, so this is what I'm hearing is at least when someone comes in, we've got questions, right? 
So this, this is really good. So first of all, don't let anyone be alone, right? I mean, they're never truly alone, but they might not know that. Don't let anyone be alone. When they come in the door, swoop on them, okay? Even if they're like, ah, okay, like don't be like five of you be like, hey, we got you, bro, dude. So glad you're like here, okay? Instead, let's do something a little different. If you go, hi, welcome, I'm so-and-so. We're so glad you're here. Like, just simple manners, simple manners. Don't be like, give them a catechism from the beginning, right? Simple manners, go, we're so glad you're here. Um, what's your name? And then try to memorize it. I have trouble with that sometimes. What's your name? Say it three times, you know, Cassandra, Cassandra, okay? Whatever it is. And, um, and then be like, have, are you orthodox or what's your spiritual background? That's a great easy question. What's your spiritual background? And um, I mean, it's best if like, I mean, back in the day we had some deacons in the door, right? Who would welcome people and make sure there was order and also know who is who is, should receive and who shouldn't. And because it's just like intimacy before marriage, right? We're asking people to wait until marriage. If someone is not part of the fullness of the Holy Church, we ask them to wait to receive communion. And so saying that in the nicest way, just be like, oh yeah, we're so glad you're here. We want you to pray with us. Just a heads up, only people who are members of the, the fullness of the new covenant, which we call the Orthodox Catholic Church, um, can receive Holy Communion. We don't want you to be offended, but it's just, it's like, like intimacy before marriage. We wait until the marriage for that. And so this is the physical intimacy with God. We don't believe it's just a symbol, it's the real deal. And, and say, and you know, you can say something quickly that's like that and very gentle and be like, and we would love for you to join our church. Say that. We would love for you. If they shouldn't join your church, you always pray to the Lord. If they're going to be, if there's some pedophile or something like that, just like separate them and let them want to serve them somewhere else, right? Um, and protect us. But if they're worthy, you welcome them, right? And that welcome is so important. So important. Um, and then you can teach them to make the sign of the cross. You can say, come sit with me. Or if you're like, I don't feel comfortable with it, just take it, like if it's some guy, put him next to a guy who you know will help him feel welcome. Okay, here's the book, here's where, you know, pray with me, you know, they make the sign of the cross, right? Literally, prepare yourselves for that, okay? There's people starving for this kind of prayer, they just don't always know where to find it. Or there's all those awkward moments in the entryways, right? Uh, so, um, another thing that we do uh, at the end of the liturgy, because the welcome doesn't just, it's not just welcome, okay, tend to yourself, right? Again, make sure they're never alone. Put, put them next to someone who you know is going to be a solid prayer partner next to them. Um, somewhere, someone who you know won't wear them out. Like, you know, if some, like, you know, some pretty girl comes in, wants to find orthodoxy, and you put her next to this dude, who's like, hey. You know, <laughs> like, you know, you should know people. I mean, I'm not saying anyone's like that, but, but like, those awkward moments happen, right? And it's, ooh, so you got to have some idea of who you take them to. you got to be wise. Uh, don't take them to everyone, right? Um, uh, we have some really, I have some wonderful people who I know from our church who are, I, I swear, they're going straight to heaven, right? Like, I, I really believe they're just so pure and wonderful, but they're socially awkward, right? And and I think maybe that protected them from all the, all the other sins in the world. They're just socially awkward. And they'll be like, they'll be like things like, I had one of our wonderful members ask another person who is this poor guy who we baptized and he's homeless and we see him and then we don't see him and we see him and he was having problems with his lady friend and uh, and this member of ours uh, offers I'll go with you and we'll reconcile things together he's the last person on earth that I would ever ask to go and help someone else's marital issues right uh, so I was like oh please Lord please Lord don't let it you don't let that follow through. Um, so, so there's just some awkward moments. But was he there for this guy? Yes, he was just trying to be a little too there, right? Um, so I didn't put him there. I don't think. Uh, so sometimes you just got to think ahead, um, and then pay attention, right? Pay attention, and, and, and you know, uh, to this person who might be next to you. And then at the end of the liturgy, make sure they're not alone, right? Make sure they know where to go, where they, where they. Uh, where you're going to have coffee. Make sure they don't sit alone. Make sure they feel welcome. Bring other people, like, because you can't necessarily be this person's best friend for 24 hours. So you're going to say, hey, John, can you come over and sit? Come, I want you to meet somebody, right? You go, hey, go, I want you to meet somebody. And he said, this is his background, like you or whatever, you know, boom, <laughs> hand it off, right? If you need to hand it off. So uniting people 
who, who help them feel like they're part of this connection, right? Um, the, the plenty of tests will happen, but if they don't feel that people are warm, problem, right? That our job is to be warm, right? To be holy to them. Um, and then even though sometimes people don't want to be recognized by the whole church, we have a guest, and they're like, uh, right? Uh, that's okay, that's okay. Um, but what can you do? Uh, one is, um, you know, bring them up, say, hey, we're gonna get the, the blessed bread, right, at the end um, from, from the priest, and this is the bread that you can have, right? And that's part of the, the agape feast, right? Leftover of the agape feast. Um, we have a holy water tank in our church and in our, in our temple, and we make sure, we tell them, hey, you can come here, you can drink the holy water, right? And we tell them, remember, I mean, I always assume they know, because then they're like more willing to be taught. I said, remember when in Acts of the Apostles where St. Peter would bless like handkerchiefs and aprons when he couldn't go to a village and he says this, he, people say, come to my village and heal the sick. He goes, I can't. So he would bless things and give it to them and say, touch this to them and they would be healed, right? And say, we still believe the same God, right? Who can bless things because God's not so wimpy, he can't bless things. Even Jesus blessed, blessed the mud, right? made clay, spat with his own spit, blessed it, and put it on a man to heal his, his sight. So we say, do you believe? I will say that sometimes, like, do you believe that? And usually they'll be like, yeah. Like, then you make the sign of the cross and you ask God to heal your body or soul in some way, drink. That holy water helps, right? We believe it helps us, why wouldn't it help them? And they don't need to be baptized and fully illumined to drink it. Or some of them, they say, I have, um, you know, I'm having a really hard time in life. And we say, come, before I was a priest, I'd be like, okay, come to the priest and, and we'll see if we can get you a blessed palm branch, right? And whatever it is, let them participate to the max with blessings, right? And holy things to take with them. Uh, sometimes, especially people I know I might not see again because of their poverty or whatever, um, I want to send them home with icons, even if it's just paper card icons, crosses, um, a, a cross necklace, whatever it is, like to have these things at your church, people, you'd be surprised. Even people traveling through, they're like, I'm trying to get to Montana and I'm just stopping here to see if there's any help I can get. We have a food pantry, we have a clothing pantry, and we have all these blessed things. So would you like to come in and pray first? I'll, you know, I'll pray with you. Um, and when they leave, like, somebody's just blown away. They're like, I'll probably never be able to get back here anytime soon, but this was an experience of God. It wasn't an experience of, let me give you a 50-minute catechism. It was an experience of love and respect and worth, right? Their human soul is worth so much. So do you see, do you do stuff like this? No. Do it. <laughs> with a bonus blessing. I mean, if there's no problems you have with any of that. Once you have our own building. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so those are those are things. So um, when people come to us, so I'm talking strangers, right? Visitors and guests. Um, we get people off the street, people, some people are homeless, some people are not, but people of great poverty. And we, we first think, hi, how are you? Welcome them, just like you would welcome anybody in your, in your job, right? Um, let alone your home. Care for them materially first, right, if you can. Uh, we keep uh, three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. We're at the church from like 9 a.m. to like 2 p.m. Uh, and more, there's also a Bible study in one of those evenings and a catechism class in one of those evenings. And of course we have Saturday evenings and everything Sunday. So every day but Mondays, we have some ministry at the church. And just being there and having doors open and enough people to keep it safe too. You know, you don't want, um, like we have an elderly sec a church office secretary. We say when she's alone, like don't let anybody in because we can't guarantee she's safe, right? But if I'm there and maybe someone else, we're like, come on in. If you punch me, I'll still be able to call the cops. You know? <laughs> um, and there are times where we've had like some schizophrenic situations and it was like, woo. Um, and I know Kung Fu, so that helps too. Um, but uh, no, it's, I wouldn't use it. Uh, but I know how to dodge, I know how to dodge. Um, but we take care of the body. Some of our first questions are, um, hey, what, what do you need? You need some food. We have a clothing pantry with a few things like underwear, socks, hats, gloves, you know, maybe some pants and um, and we have toiletries, like, what do you need? We, and we, we send them, we have bags that are like to-go bags for people who have no ability to cook. It has, and nothing they need a can opener for. We have also full boxes of food, and we have toiletries of all kinds. And we say, do you need to use a restroom? And be prepared, 
if they use the restroom, they might be in there a while, right? And sometimes they're taking like a sponge bath because they haven't had one in days. The kinds of folks who, when you shake their hand, you've got black marks all over your hand because they're so covered in soot. But just remember, your sins are grosser than that soot, right? Our sins are grosser than any of the soot they could put on my hand. Uh, it's a concept, right? Because we're so like, yeah, right? But it's okay to have a moment of the reaction to just go, it's fine, because Christ took on way more than this, right? <laughs> and then be prepared to clean the bathroom afterward, because it might need it. Some of those folks, they don't know how to clean up after themselves. They have vision problems. They might not see the mess they leave behind. Sometimes they amaze me. Um, and sit with them. Say, don't just be like, there's coffee over there. You get them a cup of coffee. And you have them sit down and you make sure someone makes some food. Like we have little stoves and we, we might cook them eggs or toast or whatever. And we just sit with them and we say, tell us about yourself. Are you from here? Just talk, treat them like a friend. And some of them you'll notice their mind is not all there. That's okay. You need that. You need that opportunity to learn what they're like, right? So you're learning, not just giving them something. You're learning how to care for those in need. Um, and uh, again, bring them to the... Just like we would bring people to Christ, bring them to the priests, right? Bring them to the priest. He can do stuff that you might not be able to do, and that's awesome. And you might be able to do stuff that he can't do. You, um, who goes out into the field? The generals, generally, or the soldiers? The soldiers. So in the spiritual battle, that's your job to make sure to go out and bring people. You can't just ask the Abuna to do it, right? And I know you're already, you know that, but just to remind you, yeah, Bert. I was going to ask, how do we know to come to you guys? You can actually tell us, like we advertise that. There's many ways people find us. We find sometimes they're just, they've driven past for a year. I had a lady who was like, oh, it was maybe it was like two years. She's like, every time I drive past, I'm like, I should go to church, but I don't. Every time I should, I should go to church, and then one day, um, well, her son was diagnosed with something terminal if he didn't have this surgery. And so she came, she called, she says, well, here's the situation. Do you have some money? I'm like, come here. Right? Just come here. Let me pray for your son, etc. Brought the whole family into orthodoxy in a fast way. Um, she's got major problems, poor thing. Um, so she's hard to find. But the husband remained. She brought the husband to the church, and now he's still with us. Um, and uh, so still trying to serve this family. It's not easy. But this woman just was driving past, and finally one day things were bad enough. So. Um, I, other people, they just checked out um, Orthodoxy online and they found our website, and so they came in. Um, other folks, they heard about it through a friend. Um, they see us in our ministry, in our neighborhood. There's lots of poorer families too, so we go out with like a box of food, and we're not trying to get noticed, we're just trying to serve, but in the process, sometimes you get noticed, right? So people are like, that's nice. I don't want to be Christian, but that's really nice of them, right? And you have the people like, well, I'm not a churchgoer, but I'm really glad you guys are doing this work. You're not a churchgoer yet, maybe one day, right? Um, other times, uh, yeah, you just I, random things. Uh, we have a we use a, a service called Flocknote, and it's like a it's a it's a text and email service designed for churches. They actually do more than that; they do financial stuff too. And um, on our website, people can just randomly join it and get messages from the church. And every once in a while, I go through it. I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> like, I've never heard of this guy. Father, have you heard of this guy? To my, to my dad, Father Michael. And he's like, no, I was going to call him. I was like, I'll call him. So I call him up. I'm like, hi, who are you? No, I, I'm like, where are you at? No, uh, uh, I say, hi, I'm Father George. You're on our flock note group. And he said, oh, thank you for calling me, Father. I had no idea what it meant to this man. He had had some difficult, difficult situations because of pastoral scenarios. He was already Orthodox. He had some major pastoral neglect and I think maybe pastoral abuse from another church and it wasn't Oriental Orthodox not that that's impossible but um, just the fact that I called him meant everything to me and I kept inviting him and within like six months or I think it was yeah it was about that he just started coming regularly and now he's like one of the most active members so he signed up on this random you know information venue that we have and just I contacted him and that was enough, right? Um, other folks have come through marriage or through friends, um, or were just like, I was just in the neighborhood and I just want to see what you guys do. And it's not always like that. There's some folks that's like years later, they're still telling me how they're struggling to find a church because of this or that. And I'm like, interesting. <laughs> so like, why did you come here? They're like, 
Yeah, I probably should. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so it's a dynamic thing, but yeah, uh, we want to have more outreach and become more visible. I think we're in a transition where we're trying to become more cohesive because our diversity is great, but sometimes it's pockets of diversity. Here's the converts, here's the Coptics, here's the Eritreans, or, or Coptics and Middle Easterners because they all speak Arabic. And then here's the ones who don't speak their mother tongue, but they also are socially awkward because they spend all their time with their home. Right, uh, so trying to make a cohesive group. So we've had an opportunity to work more like, okay, how do we really make sure our people are connected, and then how do we bring get more witness out there? So, yeah. uh, other other awkward moments or, or things about how would we deal with this situation? Yeah, brother Eddie, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember one, uh, I brought one of my friends to church, and uh, he needed cake, and he just looked at me and said, "Wait, everyone's gonna have this, the same spoon." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and we you know and so some of it is about time and just like yes from the same spoon because we're one family and we say don't be afraid. We say but but what if we get sick? We don't believe anyone gets sick from the actual body of Christ. You'll get sick from me coughing on you next to you in church, but you won't get sick from the fiery blood in the body of Christ. And so we just say we believe that God is so powerful He wouldn't let us get a disease if we were innocent, right? St. Paul says, because of our sin, that's the only way we can be sick from the Eucharist. Um, he says, don't you know that some of you become sick and even die from receiving unworthily? He says, so that's why we spend so much time in prayer, plenty of time in repentance to try to become worthy to receive, right? So we say, don't be afraid. What did Christ say? Don't be afraid. What does his angel say? Don't be afraid, right? Because we're saying something otherworldly is happening here in this world. And it's not bound by this world, right? And so getting them to say, we believe. And do, do you believe that or are you afraid? It's okay to be afraid, but we encourage you to not be worldly in all your thinking, especially about the, the Holy One who is before all worlds, right? So those are conversations that can kind of help us be like, of course we believe, same spoon. And yeah, someone might be afraid, but like, it's okay, do it anyway, because you need it. There's no other place you can get it from. Is it the same in the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. We usually do um, the in the in the Middle East. One of the traditions, um, and which is you can see in the all the Eastern Orthodox, as and the Syrian Orthodox have a couple different traditions, including the Indians with them. Um, is basically everybody receives the chalice and it contains both the the body and the blood, and so from one spoon you receive both. And then um, an ancient tradition is to drink water afterward. Um, you can see St. Hippolytus of Rome was writing about after someone was baptized, they would drink water, right? To After they after they were baptized and received their Holy Communion for the first time, they drink water to wash it down, usually for the first three times. But the Indians were like every time, every Sunday to help you wash it down. Um, but uh, the Indians will also, and Suryanis, they will sometimes just have the, the body tinctured with the blood. And so they might either they either dip and then give to you, or it's already got some of the blood on it, and then they give to you in the, and it contains both by by hand. Um, but yeah, but either way, you're receiving it from the same hand or the same spoon. Right. Yeah. Other questions or awkward moments or whatever. Awkward moment is when someone went to church and then she asks for the sign to be where the sign. And nobody comes? No. She went earlier than the time that was. Oh, yeah. She was there by herself. She was like, where's everybody? This is the right church. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So so that's, um, so we joke about how the Orthodox are late also for everything. It's a funny joke, but it's also, in a way, it's not funny. Again, it's not respectful. We respect our bosses, our employers, so much more with timeliness, right? We show our boss so much more reverence because of cash. Yeah. and fear of losing a job, right? If you knew that Christ was opening the doors at 9.30 or whatever, and then closing it at 9.35, what would you do for eternal life, right? You get to practice being ready for the second coming and your or your own death, whichever comes first. You get to practice this every Sunday and feast day. But we don't want to practice it. We want to be comfortable and say, well, I have a good reason to be late. My life's hard. <laughs> we have to laugh at ourselves and be like, no, I'm still stuck there. Am I still there? Because I, it bothers me too that our, our parish, we have plenty of people who are late all the time. Uh, and I, again, I love them. I have my own faults. They have theirs. Um, 
but it, there's something about it where it's like, okay, we're going to a family thing because the Qurbana, the, the liturgy, is a family thing. It's the family of God. And sometimes we forget that we treat it such like a family dinner, and it is a family dinner, that we just go whatever we want because my parents will be okay, right? But I think we have to approach it with a, in a balanced way. We're approaching the reality of our salvation and a family dinner, right? And Christ said, I will close the door. There should be some fear. St. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not assumption and once saved, always saved heresy, right? It's like I've been given salvation, I need to maintain it, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, but he who perseveres to the end. So um, when I invite people who are not orthodox, I expect them to be more on time than we orthodox, which is not okay. But it is what it is for now, but we're all trying to be transformed. But when they come at 9.30 and they see our own people come at 10 and even miss the gospel, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so embarrassed. I know God's embarrassed of me at least once a day. Uh, but it's one of those things like we want people to come and join our church that we don't even show up on time for. There is a hypocrisy inside, right? And we just got to be honest with them and be like, sorry, God, I'm a hypocrite. We all are in some way. We all are hypocrites, right? Just because I'm a priest doesn't mean I'm not a hypocrite, right? It doesn't mean I'm perfect. I'm a sinner, unfortunately. Um, but to work on it is one thing. And to just be like, eh, I am who I am. Deal with it, God. <laughs> it's like not the most respectful thing we can say to God, right? So you want people to come to your church. Don't tell them to come late, right? Tell them, this is when we start. I'll meet you there, right? And be there on time because you never know when someone's going to show up. When they come at 930 and we don't, they're saying, well, they don't respect their own worship. They don't respect their own God, right? So we're sending a message when we're not showing up there. And we, I got kids. I was working 40-hour, you know, weeks plus while being a priest for some time. All this stuff, my dad did the same, and I, I'm there. So I know that if I can do it, other people can do it, right? No matter how hard it is. Yeah, but just curious, how long are your liturgies? I think pretty comparable. Yeah, yeah, I think um, we start our morning praises 8.45-ish. The Divine Liturgy starts around 9.30, 9.40, and then we're done by maybe 11.15, 11.30. So is that about comparable, I would say? Yeah. And then, of course, if I'm giving the sermons, I'm always longer than my dad. <laughs> um, and my dad only does the anaphora of St. Sixtus almost all the time, which is a shorter one. And I like to give other anaphoras or liturgies. It's about the uh, liturgy of the Eucharist, or you call it liturgy of the faithful, right? I think. Um, so it's after the after the creed, basically, and the, the kiss of peace. That's the anaphora, right, for us. And we have so many anaphoras. We have like ninety anaphoras, and they're just filled with treasures. Like our anaphora of Saint Mark has like these beautiful sayings I'm just like, that we don't find in the other anaphoras. Same with Saint Peter and Saint Luke. It's just like a gem. So I want to share these wealth with everybody. But some of them are super long, and so sometimes they, it takes another you know fifteen to twenty minutes, maybe. Uh, Oh, yeah. I have a question related. So, wherever you live, where you live in the dominant religion, what neighborhood are you most perfect? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, very happy. And so, when they ask, like, you know, like, what are you? And you say, like, what do they look at you as crazy, right? Yeah. Like, what? what? Like, I would say, you know, they, yeah. They don't even think we're Christians. They don't realize that, like, you know, yeah, because you said two words and neither of them included the word Christian. Yeah, yeah. so I will tell them that they, I feel like they think that, you know, we're from like this craziness, like some yeah, more like, yeah. you know, um, yeah, you're, you're Christian, right? Yeah. Like, you want to remember yeah, this, right? Yeah. Even though we've been around much longer than oh, yeah. Baptist and Protestant. Yeah. Um, so my question to you is, how would you kind of like, Heard that the introduction like, yeah, of yeah. Without, like, yeah. Um, yeah, because we have we have the same thing even more. We're like we are the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church of India. <laughs> <laughs> like, who wants to join that? I was I was going past a, a, a Protestant church is like Korean Lord's Glory Church. I'm like, I know I don't want to go there, right? Because it's for Koreans, right? So oh it's the Coptic you know, church, like, it'll be like, what's a cop? I, I know the cops down the street, right? I don't do any crime or the cops will get you. Um, but uh, so what I first say is I say we're Orthodox Christians, right? 
if I'm talking to Roman Catholics who aren't afraid of the word Catholic, I say we're Orthodox Catholic Christians, because we are Catholic, right? Um, just not Roman. I'm always shocked at how many Orthodox don't know that. It's like, tell me the creed, and one holy Catholic, oh no, are we in the wrong church, right? So we are Catholic, we're just not Roman. So um, so if I'm talking to someone who's already, already Roman Catholic background, they already have so many things in order. They have the priesthood, they have the mysteries, and they love the word Catholic, right? So do we. We just don't use it. So Orthodox is a nickname for who we are. But if I'm talking to Protestants, I will say we are Orthodox Christians because they are already, there's a bigotry with some Protestants. There's a, it's straight out bigotry. And everybody has some kind of bigotry, by the way. Um, but because I've literally been talking to so many Protestants my whole life, and they're like, well, I think the Orthodox are okay, but Catholics are going to hell. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, stop. I don't say it like that. I'll go, no. Uh, I, go, I go, hold on. Hold on, you said you, you follow the, only the Bible, right? Because where in the Bible does it say Catholics are going to hell? And they're like, well, you have a point. Like, because their, their, their strategy of thinking is not longer than 500 years, and most of it, like certain backgrounds, it's not even 100 years old. Like, the way that they talk about things, they might have a few things like faith alone heresy from Luther um, or predestination stuff like from Calvin. Uh, but but basically the, the, the bank of historical knowledge doesn't go back very far, but they know that Catholics are bad, and they know that priests are bad, and there's all these things. So when you when you say, um, an Orthodox Christian, yeah, what's your background? I put the question on them first, because if you know that they're coming from a Baptist background, the more that you learn about theology, you'll have a different conversation than you'll have with a Mormon or with a Jehovah's Witness, and some of those you won't get anywhere, by the way. <laughs> Because they've already, you know, uh, but wherever you can bless them and say, yeah, very good. I'm so proud of you guys. And they always have this poor ministry. Good, great. Celebrate that. That's good. And God bless them for it. Um, but what you don't want to do is put up a wall of contention, like, because that's what often is the strategy on the other side, um, is, uh, is like, well, we're the real Christians, right? Just say, no, we have this beautiful faith that's 2,000 years old without stopping and we have a responsibility to keep it and say we are not perfect Christians, but the faith that is given to us is perfect, right? And they might say, well, that's a lot of statement. Be like, I know it's hard to believe, and so is that a man rose from the dead, right? So we say we believe, and so they might say, well, do you believe your, you know, if the Eucharist is just a symbol, or they might start with all these questions. So those are things that like. Um, not in the context of today, but like Abuna knows all the responses to those two. So like, you know, to have a day where it's like basic apologetics, where they're like, well, I believe it's just a symbol, right? I've had this conversation over and over again. And uh, so being able to slow things down and say, oh yeah, do you know where that teaching comes from? Do you know where that teaching that you have, do you know where that comes from? Knowing those roots, Abuna can really help you with that. Um, and knowing how to take the conversation a certain way. But I say first present that you're Orthodox Christians. They can find out what locality and what other historical things later. But it's good to say, there, in the beginning there was one church, and it was the where the apostles went and established the churches, um, and they were all one and had the same faith, and we still do. In a nutshell, that's the Orthodox Catholic faith. We still have that same faith. Um, and... Uh, you know, what was it? You know, it's 10? The, the iceberg. The iceberg. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so start with that. We're Orthodox Christians. If they're already Roman Catholic, we're Orthodox Catholic Christians, right? They'll be like, you're Catholic? Not Roman, but yes, because it means this, okay? Uh, and that's very important to start off on the right conversation. Um, so, you guys have your you know, cheats now? Yes? Cool, thank you. Um, let's do... Let's do these sheets, and if you finish that aside, go to the back also and write down other things. Even if we can't cover it today, these are things that... Hold on, hold on.